Good morning. I um, got a lot of comments on my shirt this morning, and uh, I wanted to explain that the vineyard regulars would know. Um, vineyard movement started out in Southern California, on the beach, shorts, Hawaiian shirts, and they continued to do that for years. The, the leaders in the church would be wearing Hawaiian shirts in the services, even as they moved off the beach into the buildings and things. And, and uh, so the older vineyard guys have continued to, to sort of do this if you go to various conferences and things, although they're aging out. And uh, <laughs> so I'm still here. I haven't been in the vineyard that long. But I sort of picked up the, the idea, and so whenever I'm speaking up here, I uh, pick out one of my Hawaiian shirts. I've got a whole collection of them now, so I can rotate them, rotate them around. But that is why the uh, bright Hawaiian shirt this morning. So, as Holly said, we'll be continuing our series uh, on Matthew, and I'm going to be in chapter 13 today, if you want to open your Bible or your app or whatever. Um, Matthew 13 is all about parables. So I want to start with some background. What is a parable? A parable is a simple story that illustrates one or more lessons or principles. It differs from something like a fable in that a fable tends to have animals and, and inanimate objects that normally don't, don't speak um, as characters, whereas parables have human characters. A simple way to think of it in the context of Jesus' teaching is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. A good storyteller can, can make you feel like you're there. I don't know if you've got one in your family, but Marcia's sister in our, in our family, she is the family storyteller. Um, I don't know how she'd do with a parable, but when she tells stories from her own life, she like relives them, and you can feel like you're there when she's telling them. It's, uh, it's excellent. Some of them are hilarious. Anyway. Um, we often remember things better when we can attach them to a story. Uh, Jesus knows this. And it helps us relate, if we can relate to the characters. Um, like the stories Jesus told were often of farmers, or fishermen, or seeds, or um, you know, things that uh, were bread. Things that were readily, common, readily available, common things in, the, uh, in Israel at the time. He would tell stories with those in it so that people could easily relate to them. Sometimes the parables were for a general audience, like the ones we're discussing today. Other times, Jesus' parable was very pointed to a subgroup of his audience. Often, it was the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the time. Uh, an example of that is in Matthew 21, where he uses the tenants of a vineyard to describe how the religious leaders had treated the prophets and even the Son of God. So we know that Jesus spoke in parables, but we might ask why. Why not just tell people straight up what you want to tell them? In fact, the disciples of Jesus, his closest students, asked him the same thing. The discussion is recorded in Matthew 13, starting in verse 10. When the disciples came to Jesus and asked him, why do you use parables when you talk to the people? And he answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but it has not been given them. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But for the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, Hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear. With their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their ears, see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Those who sincerely are seeking the kingdom, seeking a relationship with God, would be able to understand the parables by God. Those who were not 
wouldn't see, wouldn't hear, wouldn't comprehend. Their hearts were calloused. John MacArthur, in his book, Parables, the Mystery of God's Kingdom, revealed through the stories of Jesus, states, The symbolism hides the truth from anyone without the discipline or desire to seek Christ's meaning. That's why Jesus adopted that style of teaching. It was a divine judgment against those who met his teaching with scorn, unbelief, or apathy. In short, Jesus' parables had a clear twofold purpose. They hid the truth from self-righteous, self-satisfied people who fancied themselves too sophisticated to learn from Jesus, while the same parables revealed truth to eager souls with childlike faith, those who were hungry and thirsting for righteousness. So speaking in parables also fulfilled a prophecy written by David many centuries before, where Matthew writes, All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken of by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Now sometimes the Gospels record when the disciples asked Jesus to explain the parables, which is really helpful for us. For example, here in chapter 13, there are seven parables. Jesus explains the sower of the seeds, one about the wheat and the weeds, or sometimes referred to as the wheat and the tares, and the parable about a fishing net. I primarily want to talk today about two short parables that are in the middle and are not explained. But, of course, we need some context for these two. We'll start in Matthew 13, verse 36. Jesus has already told a parable to the crowd, and it's recorded in verses 24 through 30. It involves a man who sowed good seed. Then overnight, an enemy sowed weeds or tares into the same field. As things started to grow, his servants noticed that, oh my, there's you know, extra stuff in here that's not supposed to be here. And they, say, they tell the master, and they say, should we, should we gather it up? And he says, no, leave it, lest we pull out the wheat while we're pulling out the weeds. Eventually, when the harvest came, they could tell the difference between the wheat and the weeds. They would be gathering both. The wheat they would keep and store in the barn. The tares or the weeds they would burn in the furnace. Now, uh, after telling this parable to the people, Jesus went into the house. And his disciples asked him for an explanation. And it says in verse 36, He went into the house, and his disciples came and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. Jesus is often a phrase he uses for himself. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father, he who has ears, let him hear. In other translations, you'll see the word tear used instead of weeds. While we may not know what a tear is, I mean, you know, that's like not a phrase we would use. The Greek word translated weeds here is zinanon, zizanion, there we go. It's not just any weed. It actually resembles wheat as it's growing. You can't tell the difference until the grain develops, because the grain on the, on the tear is, a, is black. And so once it's, once it's matured, you can see the difference. And that's, there's a significance of waiting for them, for it to come to maturity, as the landowner said, let's wait and see. It's also like God's patiently waiting for us to come to maturity, to get beyond appearing like non-believers and bearing good fruit or good grain. What Jesus has explained in this parable 
is that the good seed sower is Jesus, the field is the world, the gatherers are angels, the good seed is the children. I, I couldn't figure out, that doesn't sound right, the good seed is the children, the seed is a plural, but it's a singular, the way it sounds. I, I just, so, the good seed is or are the children of the kingdom, gathered into the barn, and the weeds are children of the devil, thrown into the furnace. He says, even the cause of sin will be done away with. The next parable I want to look at follows a similar idea, and it's in Matthew 13, verses 47 through 50. This is a parable of the fishermen. Now, a bunch of Jesus' disciples were fishermen, so they could totally relate to this. Keep in mind that we're not looking at fishing like we think of it, with a rod and a reel. Jesus is speaking of commercial fishing with a kind where they would use large nets, throw them over a large area, and pull them in and gather, you know, like a hundred or more fish at one time. So he says in 47, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. Now, at this point, he goes immediately into an explanation. And you're thinking, well, he didn't explain the other parables immediately. But keep in mind that he's back in the house. At this point, he's just talking to his disciples. He's not with the large crowd. So in 49, so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, we have audience participation time here. Who is the doer in this, fisher, in this fishing story? Okay. Jesus. Okay, thank you. Okay, the angels, yes. Yeah, I could. The, the Jesus throws in that, the angels sort out the fish. So, you know, they're both involved here. We'll, we'll, we'll get back. Who are the fish? Us. Us, people. Right. What happens to the good fish? The good fish are kept. It actually says, uh, they're put in containers, I think. <laughs> and, uh, there it is. Sorted, sorted into containers, yes. Um, and what happens to the bad fish? Burn, thrown in a fire. Okay, we got, we got a consistency there. So in both these parables, Jesus is revealing something of the judgment to come. In both, he is the one doing the action. He is sowing the seed. He is throwing the net. In both, the angels are sorting out. He, send the, he sends the angels and they sort out the good from the bad. The children of the kingdom are gathered to him, into the barn, into the containers. In both cases, the bad are cast into the furnace. Hell is real. I don't want to focus on that. Uh, Wayne Jacobson, in the book He Loves Me, says, fear can be a heady motivation in the short term. It's absolutely worthless for the long haul. God wants a two-way relationship with us based on love, not fear. Sometimes fear gets us started towards Jesus, but it's not going to keep us there. We need to look to the love relationship that he has for us and with us. So, do you all understand? Yes, that's the response. Yes? Okay. He's saying yes. Jesus asked that same question at the end of this. Have you understood all these things? And the disciples say, sure, no problem, we've got it. And I'm like, seriously? They, I mean, if you read through the Gospels, um, uh, just, just a bit later in chapter 15, they continue to ask for explanations of his parables. And Jesus said, are you still without understanding? You know, they, yeah, they, they get it, but they don't get it. Now, I don't want to be too hard on them. Um, there are many times when I thought I had it, I understood, and then only to find out that, okay, I don't have it, I don't understand, or I got it wrong. Uh, or the other thing that happens is you get it, you intellectually understand it, but it doesn't move to your heart, and you, you aren't living it. So, I don't want to be too hard on them. I just think it's fine when I read that, that verse. Yeah, we got this. So, now I get 
to the two very short parables I wanted to focus on today. The two that Jesus does not explain. The treasure and the pearl. Now you may have, you may have heard these taught on before, I, I know I have. Most evangelical teaching on them brings out the cost of being a disciple. The cost we pay as a follower of Jesus. To impress on us that there is a cost of discipleship. While I do believe there is a cost to following Jesus, and that comes out in a variety of other scriptures, I'm not sure this is the place to get that from. I haven't thought all that much about these parables until recently. I have always felt they were sort of out of place in the context of these, given the cost of discipleship and given the, the, you know, the, the sow, seed sower and the fisherman on either side. Why the, why the cost of discipleship in the middle. And a few months ago, within a week of each other, I heard two teachers turn around the meaning of these two parables. One was John Wimber, the founder of the Vineyard Association. The other was Derek Prince, a Cambridge fellow, well-known author, and respected teacher in the 80s and 90s. I put references to their articles and, and videos um, in the notes for you there to check on if you you want to follow it up. But their teaching caused me to take a second look. What did they see here that I had missed? It's not a new revelation by any means. It's just maybe a, a different way to interpret these passages, a different way to look at them. For me, their interpretation actually made more sense. I'm not saying this is the correct or only interpretation. Right? But I, I want to share it with you for your consideration. So the first one is verse 44, the hidden treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. So let's tie this into the previous parable. Jesus was the farmer and the fisherman. We are the wheat and the fish. Here's another audience participation opportunity. Given that context, who might the man be? Jesus. Okay. Who might the treasure be? Us. Okay. Part of why I don't like the cost of discipleship interpretation is that we don't buy it. We can't afford it. We don't have to sell everything for the treasure of salvation, for inheritance, for our position in the kingdom of heaven. It is by grace we are saved through faith by the love of God. It's not a result of our doing, our giving up all that we have. It is a gift of God's love. So looking at it this way, the one who did give all he had, and we talk about regularly, is Jesus. He spent his life doing ministry, then his life was spent on the cross for our redemption, to buy us in the field, or the world, his suffering was our payment. His suffering was the payment for the field. If we follow the idea of the earlier parable, that the field is the world, then he came into the world as a man, he entered the field, bought the field for us because he found us the treasure in the world. He buried in our sin he buried in our sin in this world? That's not right. He buried our sin in this world. He paid all he had and he gave his life for us. He had so loved us that, well, you know, I'm going to do John 3, 16 here. So would you read it with me, please, out loud? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. His life not only paid for our redemption, but His sacrifice and our faith make us adopted as children of God, as sons and daughters of God, joint heirs with Jesus. We share in His inheritance. We don't buy the treasure. We are the treasure. So let's look at the next parable. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, it's not clear in the first 
parable that the man was actually looking for a treasure. It says he found the treasure in the field. I don't know, maybe, you know, metal detector going around or something, but that, that doesn't, that's not said. The, um, he just found it. But here it says the merchant is searching for fine pearls. So continuing our ex explanation, Jesus would be the merchant, and when he finds the pearl, just one, he sells everything he has to buy that one pearl. The price is the same for the treasure and for the single pearl. The merchant is looking for, for pearls. He presume he's you know, either a broker or he's going to make necklaces or something. But he goes searching, and Jesus is searching for believers. And he is willing to die to pay the price for even just one. Individually, he bought each one of us. Individually, he loved us enough to do that. Even one of us is of great value to God. In Matthew 10, Jesus said, Even the hairs of your head are numbered. In Psalm 139, it says, For you, for you formed my inner parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. In Galatians, Paul says, God set me apart from my mother's womb. One person, an individual, God is paying attention to. And it's important for us to realize that individually, we are important to God. You and I are that pearl. Jesus would have died just for one of us, just for you or me. Sometimes we struggle with the sense of, of unworthiness, um, of inadequacy. We struggle with rejection, and rejection by family or friends. But we are the pearl Jesus died for. He loves us individually forever. John Wimber remarks that Jesus wanted you before you wanted him. Just to affirm the idea, let's turn to the person next to you, or if you're sitting by yourself, just say out loud, I am that pearl. I am that pearl. <laughs> so, just to summarize, I think given the context of Jesus being the actor in the surrounding parables, and us being the wheat and the tear, or the, the wheat and the fish, then it's likely that Jesus is the merchant and the guy in the field, and that the treasure and the pearl are us. Another plus to this interpretation is that because salvation is a gift, we don't buy it. Jesus paid the price. And finally, the one who paid everything, well, is Jesus, as I said. He paid everything for us, for our redemption, to make us joint heirs in the kingdom of God. It all comes from the love of God for us, a love that we can trust. John writes in 1 John 4.16, um, now I put this in two translations to make a point. The ESV and NIV said, so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. But I think the ISV hits it better. So we have come to know and rely on the love that God has for us. The phrase to believe is from the Greek word pistos, which is faith. And when you, when you put it in a verb, it's often translated believe or to believe. But um, it also could be translated as to trust or to rely on. And we can rely on the love of God. We can rely on his love and we can take it seriously. He paid the highest price to redeem us and make us adoptees with Christ and co-heirs in the kingdom to be his possession. He bought us. He bought the treasure. He bought the pearl. We are his possession. Redemption, being bought, is only the beginning for us. In the first parable, the seeds are sown. And the angels have to wait for the grain to mature, have to wait for us to mature, to see which is wheat and which is weeds. They have to examine the fruit, the fruit of our, our lives. And that's an aspect for us too. We are his possession to act and bear fruit in the kingdom. Ephesians 2.10 For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to do. 
he had this all all worked out before. Titus 2.14, who, which is Jesus, gave himself up for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. In 1 Peter 2.9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Excellencies. I was like, what does that even mean? Um, it, his virtue, his goodness. And hopefully we're proclaiming that by our actions more than our words. While we contemplate the love of God, don't forget to demonstrate that love to others. As Paul writes in Romans, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. As he tells the Ephesians, it is love that surpasses our knowledge or even our ability to comprehend it. Let us pray.